This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Lebedew. Hey there, welcome to episode three of the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast. Although uh, Mark and I didn't actually plan it this way, we ended up using three interview clips in this particular show. Um, the focus here is on adapting things and learning things and using things from other coaches, uh, presumably from the, for the most part from coaches that we give credibility to or think of as being successful or whatever the case may be. Uh, so we've got a clip from Tom Tate, another one from Iraj Arabi Fard, and a third one from uh, Giovanni Gudetti. Just as a bit of background, uh, Tom Tate is pretty much the father of the, the Penn State volleyball programs, both men and women. Uh, as you could hear in his interview, he goes back to the very beginnings when the programs were both still club. He um, initially coached both of them at the same time. Eventually handed the women's program off to Russ Rose, who most people at this point know as having a long and successful career. Uh, he stuck with the men's program for a bit longer and then uh, eventually held, uh, handed that off as well when he felt like the university was going to give it full support and funding and, and bring in somebody to do a national search and things like that, all of which he talks about in his interview. Uh, Tom has since gone on to do a lot of work in coaching education work with USA Volleyball and that sort of thing. Um, our, the second clip comes from yeah, Iraj uh, Rabi Fard, who is a member of the ABC Volleyball Coaching um, Hall of Fame. He won over 500 matches in his coaching career at the collegiate level, where he's also a professor of physical education. He's uh, He's been re- retired from the day-to-day coaching uh, for a number of years now but remains an active researcher, still writes a lot of articles on volleyball, uh, still spends a lot of time consulting and doing coaching education, uh, including working with USA Volleyball and other federations around the world. And finally, uh, Giovanni Gadetti is currently at this time the head coach of the women's national team for the Netherlands, having uh, just relatively recently taken that over following a stint with the German national team and previously the Bulgarian national team. He also coaches at the club level in Turkey, uh, has won medals in the Champions League, the CEV Champions League, as well as the FIVB World Club Championships and uh, a couple of Coach of the Year selections in his native Italy. Each of them looks at the subject in a slightly different way but it all tends to speak in the, in the same sort of direction. So we'll, uh, we'll actually start this episode off with the Tom Tate clip and uh, go from there. It, it was one of those things where whoever was at the top of the heap as a coach, whatever that individual did, everybody just copied. There were no questions. Why are you doing this? Uh, wouldn't it be better to do that? There was none of that. It was just uh, bowing down to the guru and saying, yes, I will do this because you do that. Or your team won the championship, and therefore you must be doing everything right. Uh, Instead of asking yourself, well, wait a minute, why did they win this championship? Maybe it's because they're the only team that had a team full of athletes. And everybody else had much lesser athletes. Uh, uh, and it was crazy to me. Uh, you know, I, I would see, uh, and to some extent I'm still seeing some of this, at the time out in California in the Players Clinic, uh, volleyball was being influenced in the United States most heavily by what was going on in Japan. And... In Japan, one of the big emphases was you must contact the ball if you're forearm passing at the midline of the body. 
And so everybody spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure out how to get the midline of the body behind the ball to pass it to target. And when you look at it from just a common sense standpoint, you know that the midline of your body doesn't touch the ball. Uh, it's the forearms that contact the ball and that make the ball go wherever it's going to go. So it's got to be the forearms that you focus on to try to get that platform to be where it needs to be to receive the ball and send it off in the direction and with the kind of trajectory that you need to get it to target. And it doesn't matter where the midline of the body is or which foot is forward or whether you've got both feet on the ground or one foot on the ground or no feet on the ground when, those platform, when that platform contacts the ball. Uh, again, I'm glad that I didn't come into coaching from a player's perspective, having had lousy coaching as a player. There was a distinct advantage to me, uh, and, and it forced me to really ask constantly why uh, and examine things carefully rather than just copying. All right. Um, the the bit that I like, uh, I mean, I like the whole the whole comment and the whole mind process that Tom has here. But one of the things, one of the aspects of of what he talks about, actually, is something similar to what Vital Heinen recently said in an interview. And Vital was making the comment, somewhat tongue tongue in cheek, I assume, that uh, winning makes you right as a coach. Um, and Tom was obviously making a very similar sort of point, saying. Everybody's following, the, well, you know, he's calling the guru, but whoever won the last championship or, or whoever's coaching the national team or whoever is in, you know, a position of high prestige. And a lot of this, this respect is some of it's earned, some of it's deserved, but in some cases it's not necessarily based on necessarily coaching ability, especially when you get into a position of just saying, hey, you know, that team won the league championship. We should do what that team does because, as Tom says, sometimes it's just a question of athleticism. Some teams just have better talent than other teams, and they're going to win. And sometimes they're going to win, maybe even oftentimes they're going to win as a result of that talent and not as a result of the coaching or and potentially despite the coaching. So we can't necessarily assume that just because somebody's got a winning record or won a lot of championships or whatever the case may be, that they're an awesome coach and that we should do exactly what they should do. Um, the reality is you need, you need to take a look at the underlying causes and reasons for what they're doing and, and see if that makes sense. I think I look at it from kind of a, from a slightly different perspective. I, um, uh, the point is is an exceptionally valid point. I've, coming from Australia, um, we have, uh, I guess, uh, an inferiority complex in lots of things. But but in volleyball, we have historically had an inferiority complex that anybody who came from outside must know better than us. And uh, we've done in Australia some ridiculous things that didn't hold up to any sort of logical reasoning um, just because the person who did it was a, came from outside Australia and must know better. So the, the idea of the guru and particularly the, the examples that, uh, that Tom gave of, of Japan, uh, some of them uh, rang, rang not only true but uh, triggered, triggered memories, not all of them, not all of them good. Um, not about Japan specifically, but about that that kind of idea. I think um, to the point of uh, why coaches win or why teams win, their each coaching situation I think is is unique, and 
um, it's a combination, an interaction of the groups of the players, the staff, the uh, the situation, the opponents obviously uh, uh, play an active role in in the um, wins and losses of the of a particular team, and um, I think all coaches have valid elements, all successful coaches, and have valid elements in in what they do, but. Uh, it has to be considered in context, and your context is almost certainly different from that coach's. Right. And actually, to to your point about the the Australian inferiority complex, that sounds an awful lot like what Mick Haley said about U.S. coaches in in say the '60s and the '70s, when he made the point that you know, anybody who came in from outside, whether it's Japanese or Korean or Soviet or, or whatever. They, you know, everybody was automatically taking what they were saying as being exactly what they need to do without necessarily going back and, and trying to figure out, well, what really does make sense and and what's biomechanically sound and, you know, all these other things. So, yeah, it's, it's not just the Aussies. And I'm sure that probably applies to a lot of other cultures. Because um, I think even, even in England, I, I kind of saw a bit of this because they, you know, inherently kind of say, well, you know, we've we've only ever qualified for an Olympics because we hosted, those sorts of things. So they they want to bring in external experts to to help out in the coaching ranks, and and that's a you know certainly it's it's good for cross fertilization of ideas and broadening the perspective on things. But as you say, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean that you're bringing in better better ideas no no i mean there's there's lots of ideas and um and uh, as uh, uh this also is a as a theme that uh, one of the future interviewers uh iraj uh, brings up about um questioning questioning those guys who are who are successful and and not just uh, not just blindly copying it I develop an understanding that this drill can help my team. This drill is uh, false or not good. And uh, even if I would bring a good team, a good drill back home, I would never present it the same way. You always have to alter it somehow to match the ability and the interest and the level of your team. So uh, as soon as I was able to do that, then I got away from copying people. Uh, you copy some people and uh, you don't have the same situation and you may not get the same result. Uh, it, it is best for you as a coach to develop a sense of what your team needs and go for somebody who has found a better way of training and even if you find the right type of drill, you just come and uh, adjust it to your team. And that's how I really uh, would do. I, another thing, coaches don't like to tell other people their specifics or secrets. I, every year, had uh, shared my ideas with coaches at the national level. Uh, why? Because... I don't think even if one person of your team changes, the chemistry of the team change, the goals and their experience change, and you can't have one year of coaching and five years of repeating it. You see what I'm saying? Right, yeah. You know, you, you sometimes coach one year and good uh, drills and so forth, that became tradition, and you repeat it five years, six years. Well, I never believed on that. I always believe that my next year of training should be based on me sitting down and change, seeing the changes and coming up with new stuff and, and uh, not not be the same as last year. Um, your competition change, your environment change, your uh, facilities change, your budget change, your chemistry of the team change. So you really have to, every year, decide a program for your own and uh, a training method of your own team. I think that it's a, um, it's also one of my themes um, 
the advice that I that I always give to people is that uh, you know you have to question, you have to ask why something works like that, ask why it should work, and and I think uh, for all coaches this is this is the most important thing. Right. Yeah. I, I, so one of the reasons I really, I mean, you write this interview, and, and we'll talk about some other stuff in, in another episode. Yeah. He's, he's he's all over the place in terms of different ideas and perspectives, and and having been a, a physical education professor and academic and researcher, he he, he brings in a different side of things than a lot of us who come more more directly through the coaching ranks um, necessarily think about. But he, he, even he talks about when he first started in volleyball, at least in, in coaching terms, where he was kind of being pushed one way or the other based on whoever he just last saw at a seminar or, or read about or, or whatever, yeah. and, until he kind of realized, hey, I need to do things that are right for my team in my situation this season. Yes, and that's going to be different from what Joe Coach is doing with his team, yep. and it's going to be different for me next year with next year's team, even if it's the same group of players yep. in the same conference and all of that. Yeah, Iraj speaks specifically about drills and that uh, drills aren't replicable from one group to another, and I I think that's a that's a really great point because. Um, even assuming you have the the right numbers of people, um, you know the the relationships between the skills. Some teams are better at this and better at that, and um, you know if you have two dominating dominating players, a drill doesn't work the same as if everybody's the same level. And uh, maybe the maybe the gym's a different size. You don't have the same equipment. There's there's a, a dozen reasons at least why why you can't just copy a drill from one context to, to the next and um you know it, it's the theme is the same not not following a guru not accepting or not copying drills the the general point and the specific point i think are the same well and, and speaking more broadly to something that you and sue Gazansky talked about the idea that you know, some coaches want to hoard their information and their knowledge and not share it with anybody else. Yes. Whereas others are extremely open and will will talk about whatever at any at any given point in time and and aren't worried that if they you know tell somebody something they're giving away quote unquote their secrets. Um, and it always makes the point that you know every situation is different. So even if I tell you everything that I'm doing right now, <laughs> I'm not going to be doing it next year. Or maybe even next week or next month. The uh, the thing I love most about that is that it's almost paraphrasing me. So uh, <laughs> um, obviously, obviously, his point's an incredibly wise point. What can I say? But there you go. It's true that you can't even if you even if you try to do it the same, you can't do it the same. It's uh, it's right. just impossible. And and. Uh, um, if we we bring in another future interview with uh, Giovanni Guidetti, and he he talks about the coach that the coach has to be authentic and and follow, um, and this is me paraphrasing or extending a little bit, but but follow his um, his beliefs and, and that he has a consistent basis for for it, uh, for what he does in his work. Well, if you see, if you see um, the Americans speaking about, I mean, I saw your website, and you, in your website, you have McGowan. Yeah. So when when McGowan speak about volleyball, is is showing six, seven coaches on boxes, attacking on the net. Yeah. And he's telling in America we never do this. You know, and then you go to Brazil and you you go to see the the, the training of Benadinho. And you see for three players, ten coaches, all in the boxes. Yeah. And they are training and they're training like this. And so and then you watch the history of volleyball. I mean, I don't have the exact number, but let's say United States have twenty medal gold medal, Brazil have twenty gold medal. <laughs> so how you how you can say they are wrong, they are right, they are right, they are wrong. You know? And they are seeing volleyball in a very different way. 
different way. And if you put Russian, they see in another different way, and they are winning. So, and I think this is the, the key of, of, of our job. So it's, it's, it's stupid, I think, to just marry a philosophy and just go with there, because there is not one philosophy. There, is, there are many, many ways to achieve the result. It's according on first of, of what we think is correct, because I believe that the, the, the first thing that we have to, to be like a coach is that we have to be authentic. I don't know if it's good English, authentic. Oh, you I, know, but I, I think it's that perfect. The, I think, yeah, yeah I understand, you understand what I mean. So we have yeah, to, yeah. Do, to be ourselves every time. So we have to do something that we believe. And, and, and there is no the, the true about nothing. You know, that, that is what I think mostly. He uses the word authentic, which I think is a... Uh, especially for a non-English speaker, a perfect a perfect explanation for for, for what it is. A, a coach has to be authentic, and um, coaches I think often think that they can pull the wool over over their players' eyes and trick them into doing things. But it's not my experience that uh, that coach that players are easily fooled. No, I think I think players are probably a lot smarter than most coaches necessarily think they are. I'm certain. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's it's really easy as as coaches to be kind of living in our own heads, yeah. and we need to do this, and I need to do that, and you know, I got to tell the players this, and I got to teach them to do that, without taking into account the fact that unless you're dealing with very very beginning level players, you're talking about people with with at least some degree of experience, yeah. and experience in how they do it. Yes. Because no matter how you want them to do it, from whatever perspective you take it, everybody's a little bit different, and that means everybody's going to do things a little bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, you go. No, I was I was going to just make a comment about you know he Giovanni talks about you know you go into the the U.S. gym and they train one way. And then you go into the, the Brazilian gym and they train a different way. You go to the Russian gym and they train yet another way. And yet, if you look at the medal counts and the trophy counts, they're all in the same basic band of success. Mm -hmm. And you know, everybody obviously thinks their way is the best way, but I have yet to see any specific research that tells us which way is the best way. I think that um, Carl McGowan might say that there's a lot of research that says that their way is the best way. I, well, yeah, it's, I think when you talk about the game teaches the game and 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 the uh, what do you call it the um, the random versus block and the retention, then obviously you do have you do have quite a bit of scientific research um, that, that supports that, but. At the same time, you've got other things that are that are going on. As you say, you know, you've got different cultures and and different historical perspectives on things, and and just as a result, none of these cultures are going to are going to train the same way anyway. Even if you gave them the book and said, "This is how you ever everybody should do it," there's always going to be some sort of nuance. Yeah, I don't. I think. To extend uh, Giovanni's Giovanni's point about uh, which is the right way and, and how do you choose the right way, I I think I'm convinced that the most important thing is that the that there is a, a, a concept and the concept is not uh, just a um, a superficial thing, but it, it it follows all the way through in in how you want to play the game, what style you want, what tactics and strategies you use, how you train, how you interact with the group. So, with the group. And I think yeah. those things are, are unique, have to be unique for each person, but they have to also be, um, they have to be there, they have to be, they, it has to exist. And, and if the, if, the coach has a concept, and um, I picked this phrase up from uh, from Big Bang Theory, but has a logical internal consistency. If one if one thing moves on to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, then 
I think that explains how it is that there are so many different ways that can that are successful, even if from the outside we might not understand why it is that they are or how it is that they are. Right, and and to kind of extend that, to, and to bring up something in yet another interview, um, the one with uh, Anders Christensen, yeah, where he talks about the the idea of of, of selling to the team, yeah, um, which I know uh, you know uh, others have, have have used very similar terminology, but mm -hmm. convincing uh, if. If what you're saying is not consistent and what and doesn't follow some sort of logical progression, then you're going to lose the players. Yep. And at a certain point, they're just going to stop believing you. Uh, yeah. And, and then you're done. And you can only maintain that logical consistency or that consistency if you're authentic. If you're forever trying to copy somebody else or forever following a guru, then it's much more difficult to uh, to keep that consistency. It's like uh, um, being caught in a lie, basically. Yeah, yeah. And as much as we've heard coaches, and Arise spoke to this specifically, uh, and I, I can remember others that we've interviewed have said it as well, about being shifted every time they went to a new clinic. I've heard players talk about it in regards to their coaches. Like, oh, we started every new preseason, with whatever new techniques coach had learned, you know, during <laughs> during traveling around the, the states, doing camps with other coaches or whatever, or going off to the convention, yeah, or something like that. So the players definitely notice it. It's oh, yeah. and I, I've definitely I've, I've heard of situations where coaches have completely changed the whole technical structure of the way they taught the sport from one season to the next, which is a bit of a shock. <laughs> I. I think you can you can do that. Obviously, if you move from one team, if you start with a new team, you can you can do something different. But um, to, to change everything all in one time, it, it essentially gives a message to the players that I didn't know what I was doing before, which implies why should I know what I'm doing now? And yeah, um, exactly. It's a uh, like I said, the the coach has to have a a concept, has to have his idea, his or her um, uh, philosophy, methodology, and and follow that one through. And and you can always introduce new drills and and make tweaks here and there because you know you without continually striving to be better, you can you can never ach achieve anything. So so you have to make changes to. To keep to keep getting better, but um, right, or even yeah. to just freshen things up at times, because uh, sometimes the players just get stale, and you know, training gets a little boring, and you start losing, you know, the plot a bit, and you just kind of need to shuffle things around. Just you know, like you say, even one new drill, one new game, as long as it fits in with the, the team and what you're trying to do, you know, that's that's fine. That's the idea. Exactly. That's uh, that should be. Some change should be built into your concept. Right. Yeah. You just want you just uh, one of the the blog posts that I wrote relatively early on was the idea of uh, of most of us at at one stage at the early stages of our career were drill collectors. Everywhere we went, we we, we took down new drills, and we could have filled up you know reams of paper. Or these days, I don't know. Reams of <laughs> many, many bytes and bits. Megabytes. With diagrams and, yeah, megabytes, many megabytes. Yeah. With diagrams and descriptions and now video clips and all that. And YouTube is obviously full of them. Oh, yeah. um, but it always comes down to, and I've, I've heard a lot of coaches talk about having, after the point where they had a handful of games and drills that they use on a regular basis, they just adapt them to what they need to accomplish in a particular session. And that's that goes right back to what a Rise was having to say is everything has to be adapted to to purpose. Your yeah. purpose in your context. Uh yes, yes. You can't train something that's uh, not appropriate to your age level, skill level, 
height level, um, competition level, every situation and every group is unique. Yeah. And even a coach is okay. different from year to year. That's true. That too. Very true. Sometimes I'm different from training to training, but that's <laughs> not, not really. <laughs> then that, that gets us back to uh, Stelios' <laughs> comments about consistency. We we're only into the third or fourth podcast here, but I think we've we've broken a record for referencing the most interviews in one <laughs> podcast. True enough. We're, well, fortunately, I think we're running uh, we're running out of time for this one. <laughs> well, with with Stelio, that's maybe maybe seven. So, so Ooh, that's, uh, that's good work by us. Right. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.